Thank you all for coming. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. It's a real honor uh, to get to welcome you all to tonight's 21st annual William E. Simons Lecture. My name is Ryan Anderson, and I'm the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. I have the great privilege of serving uh, as the president. Uh, EBPC was founded in 1976 with a mission to apply the riches of the Judeo-Christian tradition to contemporary questions of law, culture, and politics. And for the past 47 years, EPPC has been at the center of the national debates over the moral and ethical norms that should inform our laws. Our vision is to build and sustain a society where families and faith communities flourish, where the traditional American way of life thrives, where, as Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us, just laws are enacted by having our man-made laws derived from the natural law and the eternal law. EPPC and our scholars have consistently sought to defend and promote the natural law and the eternal law, along with our, found, our nation's founding principles, respect for the inherent dignity of the human person, individual freedom and responsibility, justice and the common good, the rule of law and limited government. We don't have a grassroots activist program or a lobbying shop. Uh, we're a team of scholars. And our scholars strive to perform the scholarship on the issues that matter most when it comes to human nature and human flourishing, scholarship that couldn't be conducted inside of today's universities. Our scholars think deeply and educate the public broadly about the questions that matter most for building a culture that protects and nourishes authentic human dignity, human identity, and human flourishing. If you aren't familiar with us, I encourage uh, you to visit our website, sign up for our weekly emails, and explore some of our programs. Uh, you'll find our scholars doing important work on bioethics, the beginning of life, the end of life, regulations respecting COVID, uh, family policy, especially in a post-Dobbs era, HHS regulations, um, thinking about the person and identity, responding to transgender ideology, education reform, especially public education reform, the courts, the constitution, and the culture, technology and human flourishing, evangelicals and civic life, and Catholic studies. That list I just rattled off, we have a program in each of those areas, and uh, I think you will find it uh, quite worth your time. And tonight we're here to hear from the cornerstone of our Catholic studies program, George Weigel. Uh, George is EBBC's former president and our current distinguished senior fellow. He holds our William E. Simon Chair in Catholic Studies and directs our summer program in Poland on Catholic social thought, the Tertio Millennio Seminar. I know we have several alums of the program uh, TMS here tonight. Uh, George is, so, I'm, I myself am, a, am an uh, alum of that program. It's where I first got to meet George. Uh, and I've learned a great deal from him over the past 20 or so years. And I know we're all in for a real treat tonight with this 21st annual William E. Simon Lecture. Excuse me for one moment. George's previous 20 Simon Lectures have covered a wide swath of intellectual territory, from political philosophy to just war theory, from contemporary world history to the enduring role of religious conviction in public life. Many of these lectures have anticipated the key issues and arguments of today, and all of them have been animated by George's distinctive combination of philosophical, theological, and political insight. Tonight, George brings many of his previous themes together in a reflection on the war that has been underway against and in Ukraine for just over a year. I'd like to thank the Simon Foundation for supporting George and sponsoring these 21 years of lectures, and to thank their senior program officer, Amy Allred, for being with us tonight. Following the lecture, there will be a Lenten reception, uh, and the Catholic interest, that makes it sound like it'll be meager, it actually won't be meager, and there will be an open bar. Um, and the Catholic Information Center will be selling books to enhance your Lenten experience, including many books uh, that George has authored and that other EBBC scholars have authored. Uh, with all that said, uh, please join me in welcoming George to the lecture. Thank you, uh, Ryan, and good evening, everyone. Since uh, tonight's topic is a serious and even somber one, I want to begin on a slightly lighter note, uh, taking a wonderful story from the just published or about to be published book, uh, The Noise of Typewriters, 
by our EPPC colleague, Lance Morrow, whom many of you, perhaps without knowing it, uh, read years ago as Lance wrote more Time Magazine cover stories, particularly Man of the Year stories, Person of the Year stories, Thing of the Year stories, than, than anyone in history. And he's written this wonderful memoir of his life in journalism that has this absolutely laugh out loud story in it of some smart aleck going up to Henry Kissinger and saying, Dr. Kissinger, how would the history of the modern world have changed if Nikita Khrushchev, rather than John F. Kennedy, had been assassinated in November 1963? And without missing a beat, Henry said, I am quite certain that Aristotle Onassis would not have married Nina Khrushchev. <laughs> That's the light note for the evening. One year ago, something considered so unlikely in the 21st century as to be virtually unimaginable happened. A large European state mounted a full-scale, full-spectrum invasion of another large European state. The invaded state posed no threat to the aggressor's security, only to its leader's warped ideology. And in another chilling parallel to the mid-1930s, scripts first written in that low decade returned with a vengeance. The aggressor polluted the global information space with a barrage of propaganda and lies, while some in the West, echoing Neville Chamberlain, asked why they should be concerned about people far away of whom we know nothing. Now, after a year marked by devastation and bestial cruelty on one side and astonishing courage on the other, the Russian war on Ukraine stands before us as a pivotal moment in contemporary history. Grasping what that pivot means, what that moment means, is essential to ensuring that the pivot ultimately turns humanity in the direction of peace, security, and freedom, rather than toward a Hobbesian world where all are at war with all. So what does Ukraine mean? What has been revealed by the Russian war on Ukraine these past 12 months? What Ukraine means for world politics is that a seemingly stable post-Cold War settlement in Europe was in fact a truce. What Ukraine means for Russia is that its political culture is suffering from a false historical cultural narrative that has metastasized into a form of paranoia, resulting in the country's descent into kleptocratic autocracy and its virtual exile from the ranks of civilized nations. What Ukraine means for Ukraine is that an impressive process of nation building that has accelerated since 2013 must be continued and intensified in the midst of a war for national survival. What Ukraine means for the United States is that there is no holiday from history and no escape from world politics for America and Americans. Each of these themes must be explored in greater depth and some conclusions drawn about the larger meaning of all this for Western civilization. But before that, some basic facts are worth reviewing. The Russian war on Ukraine did not begin on February 24th, 2022. It began eight years earlier on February 27th, 2014, when Russian forces invaded the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine and Crimea, which Russia then illegally annexed on March 18th, 2014. This aggression violated the Budapest Memorandum of 1994 by which Ukraine gave up the nuclear weapons it had controlled since the dissolution of the Soviet Union in return for a guarantee of its territorial integrity signed by the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Russian Federation. 
The Western response to Russian aggression in 2014 was weak and ill-coordinated, and a grinding eight-year-long war of attrition began in the Donbass. Over that period, more than a million Ukrainians were internally displaced. Some 15,000 were killed, including pro-Russian separatists, Ukrainian soldiers, and civilians. Ukraine's economy was seriously disrupted, and both President Vladimir Putin and his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, a kind of upmarket Joachim von Ribbentrop, indulged the big lie in a breathtaking manner. Counting on a similarly feckless response from the West, Russian ground, naval, and air forces struck Ukraine across a broad front on February 22nd of last year, expecting to reach Kiev in days. After conquering the capital, the Russians intended to depose the democratically elected Ukrainian government, kill its senior officials, and deal similarly, which is to say lethally, with civil society leaders around whom resistance to the Russian annexation of Ukraine might be expected to rally. A fierce Ukrainian resistance to the invasion, displaying a degree of national cohesion and will that stunned many in the West, wrecked Putin's plans for a blitzkrieg-type victory, as did the incompetence of the Russian army's leadership, the low morale and poor training of its soldiers, and the inferior quality of their equipment. The frustrated moral monster in the Kremlin, following a script he had previewed in Chechnya and Syria, then made war on Ukraine's civilian population and infrastructure. The devastation over the past year has been staggering. Ukraine's economy shank, shrank by 30% in 2022, and current estimates are that reconstructing what Russia has wantonly destroyed in Ukraine will cost between 700 billion and a bi trillion US dollars. Some statistics illustrate the magnitude of the damage done by a militarily clumsy aggressor with no regard for the laws of war or even elementary human decencies. As of February 9th of this year, more than 75,000 civilian infrastructure facilities in Ukraine have been damaged or destroyed by Russian bombing, missile attacks, and drone strikes, including almost 60,000 residential buildings and houses, over 2,200 schools and educational facilities, and more than 400 medical institutions, including hospitals and clinics, many of which seem to have been deliberately targeted. Almost 500 cultural sites throughout the country have been destroyed, and at least another 650 damaged. Almost 4,000 Ukrainian electricity and water networks have been damaged or destroyed. Russia's targeting of Ukraine's energy infrastructure has included 13 massed missile attacks and 15 drone strikes, most recently yesterday, damaging 50% of Ukraine's energy facilities and costing the country 10 gigawatts of power capacity, enough to power 7,500,000 homes in the United States. Ukrainian law enforcement agencies have investigated 65,000 war crimes and crimes of aggression over the past year, including the deaths of over 9,000 civilians, among them almost 500 children, and the wounding of over 12,000 other civilians including more than 900 children. These figures would likely increase by an order of magnitude if they included the depredations in occupied Ukraine, to which the Ukrainian investigating authorities have no access. Mass graves of summarily executed civilians, sometimes numbering in the thousands, have been found in Bucha, Izium, Mariupol, and other previously Russian-occupied territories liberated by Ukrainian troops. These butcheries have been confirmed by international observers. One third of Ukraine's territory requires demining, a 
process that would take at least five years. And since the invasion, 316,000 explosive devices have been found and neutralized. Destruction of infrastructure has been paralleled by deliberate demographic depredations. 14,000 Ukrainian children have been kidnapped from territories occupied by Russian forces and taken to Russia, where their personal data is changed as they are given to Russian families. In those occupied territories, Ukrainians are compelled to accept Russian citizenship and are given Russian passports. And then there is the sheer emotional and psychological trauma of it all. There is likely not a single Ukrainian family that has not lost a relative in the fighting or through deliberate Russian assaults by missiles, drones, and artillery on housing, apartment blocks, hospitals, and schools. By the beginning of this year, about one-third of Ukraine's population, some 14 million people, were internally displaced or refugees abroad although some refugees are now returning. As a result of this barbarism, which includes what is called double tap targeting aimed at killing humanitarian aid workers responding to a missile or drone attack, Russia was condemned as a terrorist state or a state sponsor of terrorism last year by Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, the Czech Republic, and the Netherlands as well as by the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, the European Parliament, and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Those are some of the basic facts. What does it all mean? At the macro level of world politics, the Russian war in Ukraine has falsified the post-Cold War conviction of many in Western Europe and some in North America that a Europe without wars was possible. Perhaps there would be occasional flare-ups in the ever-restive Balkans, but big wars between big states were a thing of the past, it was thought, because alternative security arrangements underwritten by economic interdependence were in place. What seemed like a version of Immanuel Kant's system of perpetual peace turned out to be a truce, however because non-quantifiable forces were at work beneath the surface of history, much like the geological forces at work beneath the crust of the Earth. And those forces eventually erupted. On this geological analogy, a spasm of earthquakes in the Donbass and Crimea did not wake America and Europe from their Kanchan slumbers in 2014. Then came the volcanic eruption of February 24th, 2022, and the Kanchen dream was shattered. A second crucial point. The experience of the past year means that culture is far more a driver of history than most realist accounts of world politics allow. In the case of Russia's war on Ukraine, which is also a war against the post-Cold War European order and more broadly the political culture of the West, the cultural driver is a false historical story according to which Moscow is the sole legitimate heir of the baptism of the Eastern Slavic peoples in 988, which actually happened outside Kiev while Moscow was a forest inhabited by wolves and bears. The complications of Eastern Slavic demographic history notwithstanding, this Russian narrative, according to which Ukrainians are at best little brothers to the great Russian hegemon, and at worst, no nation at all, is simply false as a matter of history. But this false storyline lay behind the imperialism of the 15th century Muscovite prince, Ivan the Great, known as the gatherer of the Russian lands, and it continued to underwrite Russia's century-long empirical expansion. It even endured into the late Soviet period. Thus, in 1988, Mikhail Gorbachev's Soviet regime spent vast sums 
renovating Russian Orthodox churches in preparation for that year's millennium celebrations, which wrote Ukrainians completely out of the story of Eastern Slavic Christianity that began in 988. And whatever Vladimir Putin's true convictions about these matters, the man who once called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century has been quite happy to use this false historiography to legitimate his determination to extinguish Ukraine as an independent state and to restore a Russian empire. The great symbol of this is the 57 foot tall statue of the Kievan Prince Vladimir, who led the conversion of the Eastern Slavs to Christianity in 988, that Putin erected in central Moscow in 2016. Thus, the claim by such distinguished scholars of world politics as Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski that Russia without Ukraine can be neither a great power nor the center of an empire is both true and insufficient. Russia without Ukraine is also a Russia that would have to confront the historical fiction that has shaped and warped its national self-concept and national self-image for centuries. In addition to falsifying the fideistic belief that European wars were no longer imaginable, and beyond demonstrating the continuing power of culture as a primary driver of history, the war on and in Ukraine has clarified, or should have clarified, that there is no such thing as a self-regulating international order. Someone, some power or powers, is going to do the ordering in world affairs. Others in the West, in France, in Germany, and in the Congress of the United States have not recognized this, even though Finland and Sweden have in their application to join NATO. <clears throat> but when Mr. Putin says that his ultimate goal is, quote, the collapse of Western hegemony, he must be taken seriously. And if by the collapse of Western hegemony, he means the destruction of the systems of international security and international exchange that have pre prevented a global conflagration since 1945, while creating conditions for the possibility of billions of people lifting themselves out of abject poverty, then no sane person in the West ought to want to see Putin's dream come true no matter how much we rightly deplore the sludge involved in Western cultural imperialism, and no matter how much we rightly criticize the bottom line only approach to international economics, the green wokery, and the elitism of the Davos people. A world after the triumph of Putin's efforts to reverse history's verdict in the Cold War would be a far worse world for everyone as the global economic wreckage wrought by Putin's war over the past year should have demonstrated. To borrow from President Franklin Roosevelt when he tried to alert the American people in 1940 to the dangers posed by Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo's Japan, such a world would be a shabby and dangerous place to live in yes, even for Americans to live in. The international systems that Putin deplores under the rubric of Western hegemony can and must be reformed. What Putin wants to put in their place can and must be resisted and defeated. In addition to the destruction he has wrought in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin's war on Ukraine has done enormous damage to Russia. Any effective political opposition to Putin's dictatorship has been essentially eliminated as brave opposition leaders like Alexei Navalny and Vladimir Karamurza have been imprisoned along with thousands of anti-war protesters. All public criticism of the war 
or the Russian military's war making has been banned as treasonous. Thus in Arkhangelsk, a 19 year old university student, Alessia Kriatsova, was threatened with a sledgehammer while being arrested for protesting Putin's aggression against Ukraine on social media. She now faces 10 years in prison. These draconian means of social control, plus the fact that the Russian people live within what a dissident Russian television journalist, Marina Ovesnyakova, rightly called a gigantic propaganda bubble that regularly informs the Russian people that the West wants to destroy them, has led to the virtual extinction of a functioning civil society capable of holding the Russian state accountable or even wishing to do so. Putin's war has also made tragically clear the subordination of the Russian Orthodox Church's leadership to Russian state power, as Patriarch Kirill of Moscow and all Russia has issued statement after statement that borders on the blasphemous blessing of aggression and murder. The falsification of the deep Russian past, previously noted, continues with a falsification of more recent Russian history. Thus, a new bust of Joseph Stalin, whose only parallel as a 20th century mass murderer might be Mao Zedong, was unveiled in Volgograd, formerly known as Stalingrad, to mark the 80th anniversary of the Russian army's victory there in World War II. The unveiling came just before Vladimir Putin's visit to Volgograd on February 2nd, during which it is safe to assume that he did not criticize the record of the man who once said that a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic, and who was arguably responsible for more Russian deaths than his one-time ally, Adolf Hitler. The war on and in Ukraine has also revealed the deep corruption of Russia's once vaunted armed forces during Putin's decades in power. Financial skimming and graft in the procurement process was evidently widespread, exemplified by the defective Chinese-made tires on Russian personnel carriers bursting during the early stages of the invasion. The war in Ukraine has also unmasked a huge technology gap as second generation NATO weaponry came into play in Ukraine, fourth and fifth generation Russian weaponry proved incapable of coping. Then there is the question of leadership. When Russian forces proved incompetent in the face of Ukrainian resistance, not least because of a lack of well-trained NCOs and junior officers prepared to take the initiative in real-time battlefield decision-making, the invaders relied more and more on the mercenaries of the Wagner Group, many of whom were recruited from Russian prisons, and the brutal Chechen irregulars provided to Putin by his one-time foe and current ally, Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov. Russia's war fighting in Ukraine has been similar to its war fighting in World War II with frontline troops deployed as cannon fodder, or in Russian parlance, cannon meat, whose sheer numbers will eventually, presumably, overwhelm their opponents, irrespective of the human cost. Little wonder, then, that the original Russian invasion force included mobile cremation units as Putin did not want a flood of coffins returning to Russia and falsifying his claims to military omniscience. This studied callousness toward regular army troops and their families is even worse among the irregulars and mercenaries. Thus, Ukrainian intelligence recently heard a conversation, overheard a conversation, between a Wagner Group officer who queried his superiors about what was to be done with wounded Wagner Group members. The answer came back, drop the baggage. That is, execute them. The combination of inept 
leadership, technological inferiority, and poorly motivated troops has led to enormous Russian casualties over the past year. In early February, U.S. government officials put the number of killed, wounded, and missing, Russian killed, wounded, and missing, as, quote, approaching 200,000. Other reliable estimates put that figure at closer to 270,000, which, if accurate, would mean that, statistically speaking, every Russian involved in the invasion of February 24th, 2022, has been killed, is in hospital, or is missing. These casualty rates are unsustainable, even for Russia, and his knowledge of these figures has seeped through Putin's propaganda shield, young Russians are leaving the country in droves, not only to avoid conscription as more cannon meat, but because the Russian future looks so bleak. A war whose stated purpose was the restoration of Russian greatness has thus become the war that has stripped the mask from post-Soviet Russian corruption incompetence and self-delusion while further exposing the extraordinary social and cultural damage done to Russia by 74 years of communism. What has the war on and in Ukraine revealed about Ukraine? Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has won the admiration of a great many people around the world for his inspiring articulation of his people's cause. It is important to understand, however, that President Zelensky, whose poll ratings were cratering in the months before the war, has been following his people as much as leading them. For Ukraine is in the midst of an impressive project of national self-renewal, a project that Putin's war has paradoxically both threatened and intensified. The threat is obvious, the threat of national extinction. The intensification requires a little explanation for Ukraine's astonishing and sustained resistance for over a year, a resistance that embodies a national commitment that shows no signs of slacking, cannot be explained solely by the understandable desire to punch a bully in the nose. While the roots of today's Ukrainian national identity reach back a millennium, the national fervor, grit, and resilience displayed these past 12 months can trace their immediate origins to what Ukrainians call the Maidan Revolution of Dignity in 2013-2014. Then, after a corrupt and Putin-friendly president, Viktor Yanukovych, buckled to Kremlin pressures and reneged on, Euro on Ukraine's joining the European Union, a mass public movement took to Kiev's independent square, known as the Maidan, to demand a reversal of Yanukovych's decision. For months, the Maidan movement held out, even against armed force, and when it finally triumphed and Yanukovych was driven into exile in Russia, one veteran demonstrator said insightfully, we came to the Maidan looking for Europe and we found Ukraine. For in those often frozen winter months of demonstrations in the heart of the nation's capital, Ukrainians discovered each other and their coherence as a nation across ethnic religious and linguistic lines. The Ukraine that has resisted and in some cases beaten back Putin's aggression is the Ukraine that came to national self-awareness on the Maidan in the winter of 2013-2014. In the following years, a bottoms-up process of national civic and political renewal has taken place. Post-Soviet Ukraine suffered from a top-down system of governance in which Kiev controlled just about everything. Economic and political development aid from the West since the Maidan Revolution of Dignity 
has focused on building the infrastructure of Ukrainian democracy, social, political, and economic from the local level up. The result has been a Ukraine in which a critical mass of people feel a real stake in the country's future and believe they have a role in building that future. Since the Maidan, Ukrainians have ceased to be subjects of a faraway, centralized, and unaccountable governing system and have been on an accelerated learning curve toward a robust sense of citizenship. Two years ago, no one expected that this revitalized sense of national civic identity would result in great numbers of volunteers forming volunteer national defense units to aid the Ukrainian army in defending Kiev. Yet that is what happened. We are fighting for each other, Ukrainians tell visitors from the West. And in that sense of shared responsibility, and that sense of shared responsibility has been reinforced by the brutalities of the Russian occupiers. As Oleksandra Matvichuk, executive director of the Nobel Peace Prize winning Ukrainian Center for, Religious, for Civil Liberties, told Jay Nordlinger recently, Ukrainians are fighting not just for the territory that is historically theirs, but for the people living in those areas. As she said, this war started not in February 2022, but in February 2014. I have been documenting war crimes for eight years already. I am very aware of what Russians did to people in the occupied territories. I have interviewed hundreds of people. They, were told, they told me how they were beaten, how they were raped, how their fingers were cut off, how they were crammed into wooden boxes, how they were tortured with electricity. One lady reported that her eyes were dug out with a spoon. We will never leave our people alone in these occupied territories. It would be inhuman to live, leave them. Or as the mayor of Lviv, Andrei Sadofi, put it to Timothy Garden Ash, the Ukrainian army is 42 million people. That is, the entire country is engaged, one way or another, in resisting Putin's stated determination to eradicate Ukraine. If that's Pope Francis, tell him I'll call him back. <laughs> this remarkable process of nation building has continued and must continue for the immediate future under wartime conditions. This means further efforts at addressing the various forms of corruption endemic to post-Soviet Ukraine. Those efforts are underway, most recently when President Zelensky took stern action against a powerful oligarch and a dozen corrupt senior government officials. As Daniel Twining of the International Republican Institute wrote on February 8th, Far from sweeping graft under the rug during a struggle for national survival, Zelensky's administration has doubled down on holding senior leaders accountable because corruption has been a driver of malign Kremlin influence in Ukraine and combating it aggressively is part of the country's fight for an independent democratic future. Maintaining and extending that commitment to fight corruption will be essential in maintaining Western support for Ukraine going forward. Congressional and media naysayers in the United States who harp on corruption in Ukraine without acknowledging the efforts being made to combat it might recall a few unsavory episodes from modern American history. Harry Truman, for example, <clears throat> first came to national attention by chairing the Senate Special Committee to investigate the national defense program during World War II. Historians estimate that the Truman Committee saved as much as $15 billion and thousands of American lives by bringing to light faulty aircraft design and munitions production. Perhaps the committee's most famous target was the Curtis SB-2C Helldiver 
on which it wrote a highly critical report. Navy pilots who heartily disliked a plane used to say that SB2C, rather than designated, designating the second Navy dive, bo dive bomber built by Curtis, actually stood for son of a bitch second class. <laughs> As Ukraine continues to fight what its people understand to be an anti-colonial war against a neo-colonial aggressor, it will also face challenges in protecting civil liberties and strengthening civil society institutions. One issue is the legal status of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church affiliated with the Moscow Patriarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church. A draft law introduced in December 2022 proposed to outlaw the activities of, quote, religious organizations affiliated with centers of influence in the Russian Federation. Major Archbishop Sviatoslav Shevchuk of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church rightly objected, arguing that this would make any such banned church into a martyr church and proposing instead that the focus be on individuals, however re religiously affiliated, who are treasonous. Major Archbishop Shevchuk also stressed, however, that, quote, our northern neighbor who is killing us today cannot use any of the churches for his geopolitical purposes. That this kind of wise counsel is available publicly in Ukraine, while the Russian Orthodox Patriarch of Moscow sets up straw men and issues apocalyptic threats, publicly stating that, quote, any desire to destroy Russia will mean the end of the world, sharply distinguishes a vibrant civil society from a sick and corrupt one. President Zelensky faces challenges that will further test his character and political skills. By necessity under today's wartime conditions, Ukraine is largely being governed by the presidential administration, whose actions and decisions are publicized by television news that by presidential decree broadcasts identical content and often features government officials. There is real information exchange in Ukraine because of social media and the internet. But the question of a virtual governmental monopoly on TV news ought to be addressed before the country's March 2024 elections, while taking into account the fact that oligarchs once warped the Ukrainian information space by their ownership of television channels. As he considers his future, President Zelensky would do well to remember what King George III said when told that President George Washington would not perpetuate his power by seeking a third term. If he does that, the king said, he will be the greatest man in the world. And what does Ukraine mean for the United States? What Ukraine means for the United States is that the United States must become a serious country again. A serious foreign policy debate cannot be conducted in sound bites with chippy epithets about blank checks substituting for reason and argument. To dismiss decades of often effective support for nascent democracies around the world as the man manifestation of what one so-called national conservative recently deplored as, quote, the crusading spirit, the need to make the world safe for democracy or engage in nation building, that is just silly. I don't seem to remember reading that Dwight D. Eisenhower was pilloried for titling the memoir of his service in World War II crusade in Europe, or for using a flaming, biblically-inspired sword as the shoulder patch of those assigned to the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force Europe. Would the world today be FDR's shabby and dangerous place? Would the United States be safer and more prosperous if America had turned its back on nation building? in Germany and Japan after that war, or if a bipartisan consensus had not supported the Marshall Plan for the reconstruction of post-war Europe. 
More recently, we have the example of the new democracies of Central and Eastern Europe. However flawed they are, and all democracies are flawed in one degree or another, the new democracies that have arisen from under the rubble of the Warsaw Pact have become staunch allies, thanks in part to the support their human rights activists received from the West in the last days of the Cold War, and last decade of the Cold War, and that their democracy builders received in the d decades immediately following. Those new democracies have also been, with one exception, exemplary allies of Ukraine in its current existential fight for survival. Nor can a serious foreign policy debate worthy of a great power be conducted through what former librarian of Congress, Daniel Borston, dubbed pseudo-events, political theater concocted to draw media attention to the actors involved. House Resolution 113, the Ukraine Fatigue Resolution, recently authored by Representative Matt Goetz of Florida and co-sponsored by 10 House Republicans, is the platonic form of such unseriousness. The resolution, which states that, quote, the United States must end its military and financial aid to Ukraine and urges all combatants to reach a peace agreement was referred to the House Foreign Affairs Committee. It ought to have been referred to a House Select Committee to construct a playpen. <laughs> what kind of signal does such infantile, irresponsible posturing for the sake of a few minutes on Fox News send to the brave people of Ukraine who look to the United States for leadership in the cause of freedom and who have consistently expressed their deep gratitude for American aid? What kind of signal does it send to wobbly allies in France and Germany still imagining that Putin can be appeased? Above all, what signal does it send to Vladimir Putin, who, like all bullies, probes constantly for signs of weakness and irresolution? The costs involved in American support for Ukraine are minuscule, both in terms of the $1.6 trillion in discretionary spending in the fiscal 2023 federal budget, and in terms of American economic capacity and purchasing power. In 2022, the financial, humanitarian, and military aid, uh, the United States, population 330 million, provided Ukraine ranked behind the aid given Ukraine by Poland, population 38 million, Lithuania, population 2.8 million, Latvia, population 1.9 million, and Estonia, population 1.3 million as a, per as a percentage of gross domestic product. The admittedly grotesque omnibus spending bill passed at the last moment by Congress in December 2022 included $38 billion for Ukraine in 2023, which was approximately one half of what Americans spent in 2022 on frozen and retail pizza. Yes, accountability for US aid is imperative both for the American taxpayer and for Ukraine's own development as a functioning democracy and a trustworthy ally. But to suggest that the United States cannot afford to support Ukraine, or cannot afford to support Ukraine while deterring China, is simply not serious. That the neo-isolationism of the moment masquerades as foreign policy realism, 21st century style, is equally unserious. The true realism about what Ukraine means for the United States was well articulated by Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas in a recent op-ed article where he wrote, we should back Ukraine to the hilt because the likeliest alternative isn't peace but rather another frozen conflict that favors Russia and harms our interests. Russia would retain key strategic terrain and much of Ukraine's industry and agriculture. Food and energy prices would remain high, 
potentially starving many nations and exacerbating the migrant crisis in the West. Meanwhile, Russia could rebuild its strength and seize the rest of Ukraine when the opportunity arose. Such an outcome would create millions more refu Ukrainian refugees, drive inflation higher, and worsen supply chain disruptions. Russia would also extend its border deep into Europe. Next on the chopping block would be Moldova, site of another frozen conflict, and after that, a NATO nation. Stopping Russia also will allow the US to focus on the greater threat from China. The Russian victory would force us to divert more resources to Europe for a longer time to, deserve, to deter Russian expansionism, creating persistent threats on both fronts. But a Ukrainian victory and a durable peace will secure our European flank as we confront Russia. What Ukraine means for the United States is that it is time for the adults to frame the foreign policy debate once again. And that means, among other things, calling out the media personalities and politicians who behave like irresponsible children for what they are. Not with Twitter snark, but with calm, clear, and devastating critiques. America is not going to be great, stay great, or become great again, choose your slogan, if we do not conduct ourselves and our public debates as a mature great power should. Finally, <clears throat> what does Ukraine mean in terms of this moment in the civilizational history of the West, which has been a constant concern of these Simon lectures for two decades. Western civilization is suffering from a wasting disease of self-absorption based on defective ideas of the human person, human community, and human happiness. As I have argued before in these lectures, the dominant cultural forces in the West insist that we are mere bundles of desires, all of which are morally commensurable or equal, that the gratification of those desires is the meaning of happiness, and that seeing to the satisfaction of those desires is, in the name of human rights, the primary responsibility of the state. Meanwhile, woke culture spreading out from our institutions of higher learning like a plague and infecting the bureaucracies of the administrative state is creating a society of silos in which race mania, gender identity, and isms of all sort, sorts are somehow supposed to foster living in solidarity, although they are fostering precisely the opposite. Social fragmentation leading to perilously high levels of mental illness, violence, and public irrationality. Over the past year, Ukraine and Ukrainians have provided an alternative account of the human condition. By looking death in the eye and refusing to flinch, Ukrainians, both soldiers and civilians, have reminded the West that we are more than our subjectivity, that we can know, embrace, and live by truths greater than me. We can make sacrifices. We can exhibit courage. We can refuse to be mastered by evil. We can live in a solidarity that is based on the truths built into the world and into us. Since the Maidan Revolution of Dignity in 2013-2014, Ukraine, without realizing it, and often imperfectly, has nonetheless lifted up before a self-absorbed and often decadent West the four foundational principles of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. Personalism, the common good, subsidiarity, and, sub and solidarity. Under brutal assault for a year now, and indeed since the Russian invasion of February 2014, Ukraine has stood firm 
for the inalienable dignity and value of every human life. During a year of savage warfare, Ukraine has lived the truth in the principle of the common good that each individual's exercise of his or her freedom should contribute to the welfare of all, not merely to his or her own advantage, aggrandizement, or even survival. Since the Maidan, Europe, uh, Ukraine has been building a decentralized system of governance that reflects the social doctrine principle of subsidiarity in its respect for local initiative bottoms-up decision-making, and support for those in need of subsidium assistance. The subsidiarity principle is also embodied in an interesting way in the innovative battlefield tactics of Ukraine's armed forces and what, by what former U.S. Army commander in Europe, General Mark Hurtling, has called their culture of adaptability. Volunteer civil society groups crowdfunding materiel Ukrainian soldiers say they need, including drones, provide another example of subsidiarity at work. And Ukraine has displayed the distinctive civic friendship, the sense of mutual responsibility and obligation that bridges demographic divides and lies far beyond the woke identity silos that embodies the social doctrine principle of subsidiarity, of solidarity, excuse me. Thucydides' classic, The Peloponnesian War, has two memorable passages that have been cited and pondered for millennia. One, the Melian Dialogue, is a classic statement of realpolitik in its harshest form. As the Athenians tell the Melians, who claim a natural right to remain neutral between Athens and Sparta, that questions of justice do not bind greater powers in their conduct toward lesser powers, after which the Athenians proceed to destroy Melos. The second is Pericles' funeral oration for the Athenian dead after the first year of the war in which the great orator, according to Thucydides, says, the secret of happiness is liberty, and the secret of liberty is courage. Having refused, at tremendous cost, to resign themselves to the fate of the Melians, the people of Ukraine, maintaining a remarkable and inspiring morale under barbaric assault, have given a 21st century expression to Pericles' formula for happiness, but that they have added something of great value to it. For if the secret of happiness is liberty and the secret of liberty is courage, the secret of courage is faith. Faith in a larger reality than ourselves, faith in a destiny beyond this life and its great but inevitably transient satisfactions, faith that we are creatures capable of nobility and self-giving, not merely self-assertion and willfulness, faith that solidarity is possible amidst plurality, faith that courage can overcome someday. That is what Ukraine means, and that is why we owe a great debt of gratitude and solidarity to Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Thank you. George, for those really outstanding, uh, bracing, and challenging uh, remarks. Um, let me extend my thanks again to the William E. Simon Foundation uh, for their continued support over two decades now for making George's uh, fellowship at EPBC and tonight's lecture possible. Um, before I dismiss you, I just want to say, as you, um, you know, as you, you 
retire back to the other half of the ballroom and get to enjoy tonight's uh, refreshments. Realize that neither George nor I had anything to do with that aspect of tonight. Uh, for that, we have to thank Ella Sullivan Ramsey, uh, our colleague at EPPC, and then uh, a team of, uh, a small team of EPPC colleagues who helped pull everything off uh, this evening. So um, if you see Ella in the back, please uh, extend your gratitude to her. And with that, I can dismiss us. Uh, please join us in the reception. Thank you.